Good morning. Thank you, Russ, for those songs, Brett for the scripture reading, and Sheldon for that wonderful prayer to start our service off, as well as to Kyle and John for those comments on the table to set our minds and help us contemplate the work that was done on the cross. Last Sunday evening, um, I preached on the text in 1 Timothy chapter 4, 12 through 16, and we're not going there this morning, but um, uh, we focus there on uh, Timothy's ministry and his instruction there by Paul, how, to, how he would need to ensure about his teaching. It says there in the later part, it says, pay close attention to your teaching, persevere in these sayings, the public reading of scripture to exhortation and to teaching. And he says there in verse 14, neglect not the spiritual gift within you. And we covered that briefly, but... Uh, in the course of talking to some here and others, the question came up around verse 14 about not neglecting the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed upon you through the prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. So the question came up, well, what does that mean? And so this morning, we want to look at that question of what does 1 Timothy 4.14 mean and does it apply today? So for the next few moments or so, we're going to break that down. We're going to be asking ourselves about four questions. And by the end, I think the answer will be clear. So the first question we need to ask is, what are the gifts? Um, Because when it comes, um, sorry, about what the gifts are. Now, depending on your translation, it could be a very easy answer. Or we may have to look into a little bit deeper. I read from the New American Standard, and New American Standard puts in spiritual gifts. If you have the King James, New King James, or Christian Standard, it will just say gifts. Um, I think the New American Standard words right here, they are spiritual gifts, or miraculous gifts of the Spirit. And we're going to go into that and and see um, how we get that. Um, First and foremost, we're going to be turning to um, Acts chapter 1 here. We're going to see the first outpouring of these gifts on the day of Pentecost. Again, Acts chapter 1. Scriptures to follow along there. Now, what we see, up until this point, the gifts that the apostles and the disciples could work were directly given by Jesus, or worked by Jesus himself. This is after Jesus has ascended, and this is going to be the outpouring of the Spirit upon a certain group of individuals, the apostles. Looking in verse 26, they have, uh, um, and so this is just after they have elected another apostle. Now we understand the criteria early on was somebody who has been with Jesus since the baptism of John, who witnessed the ascension. And so out of that lot, they picked Matthias. And it says in verse 26, and they drew lots for them. And the lot fell to Matthias, and he was added to the 11 apostles. So the people we're talking about here are the 12 apostles now. Looking in verse 1, chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had come, they, that is the eleven or the twelve apostles, were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to, appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now, going on in verse 5 here, now, they were, now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when the sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. Now, I want to make this point here. We don't have time to go into a full discussion here. But it says the text, the apostles were granted tongues and a multiplicity of tongues. And we read in the same context that these individuals, devout men of all nations, came together and they heard the apostles speak in their own language. The text answers the question for us there, tongues or languages, a multiplicity of languages. But moving on here, um, verse 7, they were amazed and astonished, saying, Why are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that each one of them in our, we hear each one of them in our own language to which we were born? And then through verses 
9 through 11, you see the whole list. And we have people coming from as far east as uh, what would have been then at the time Assyria, or known as the Assyrian area, or the per- Parthian Empire. So they would speak a form of Persian. And you have people as far west as Rome who would have spoken Latin and Greek in between. Two different language families that have nothing to do with each other. And yet each one of them could understand completely with full hearing. Um, they understood in their birth time. Um, so that is one of the examples of speaking in tongues or languages. And this uh, the, the distinction on why this is a miraculous gift is that this was not like you and I learning a language. I failed miserably at French, and I did poorly in Spanish in college. Um, I got the credit, so I have the classes on the transcript, but it's not like us, where we struggle and we, we strive and we learn and we try to. In fact, if you were to try and talk to me in French today, I just know how to say cheese omelet and that's it. Um, and that's from a cartoon in my youth. Uh, Spanish is not much better. I, I, I can read it just fine. Anything else, I'm, it's, it's horrible. But these apostles didn't go through that. They had instantaneous knowledge and not, not knowledge just on how to speak it academically, but intimate knowledge. This would have been regional dialects. They would have understood the, the word plays and everything else in the language. And they understood and they could speak it. Um, so it's instantaneous. Um, these gifts would have endowed the individual with an ability or abilities instantaneously and with outside the realm of natural uh, acquisition of these gifts. You know, for me, in order to be completely fluent in language would take many years of study and daily practice and, and living with the language. These individuals did all that within moments. Um, we also see um, another type of gift. It's, it's just showing a, an example. Um, in Acts chapter 3, another gift was the healing of or the healing of individuals. We looked at Acts chapter 3, looking at, starting verse 3. Um, these men, Peter and, and John, are heading to the temple. And it says, when he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, and this is the lame man on the temple steps, he began to ask to receive alms. But Peter, along with John, fixed his gaze on him and said, look at us. And he began to give him his attention, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I do not possess silver or gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, walk. And seizing him by his right hand, he raised him up, and and immediately his feet and his ankles were strengthened. With a leap, he stood upright and began to walk, and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And when all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they were taking note of him as one being who used to to sit at the uh, beautiful gate at the temple to beg alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement, and what had happened to him. So we see, again, a different type of gift, but it's instantaneous and miraculous. Not, as a, series of, and not a series of healing sessions as, as modern healers do today, but this was instantaneous. This man had been lame for from a long time, and uh, much like uh, an individual who's, for say, bedridden for a number of months or, or even years at that point, muscle mass begins to deteriorate. They're not able to hold yourself up. My grandmother had rheumatic fever when she was in the second grade, and she had to spend almost over a year in the bed. And it took her several years after that to gain the full strength of her legs back. And she got pigeon-toed because of that, because her feet were pointed inward most of the time. Uh, For us humans, for us normal people, we have to work at it. These apostles were able to heal this man instantaneously and not to where he could hobble along and kind of walk, but he leapt up and walked with full strength. And it doesn't say he just leapt up once. He continued jumping and leaping and walking into the temple, praising God. <clears throat> but notice, we get into somewhat the purpose of this gifts, but look at verse 11 of the same chapter. While he was clinging to Peter, the same lame man who can now walk, and John, all the people ran together to them and the so-called portico of Solomon, full of amazement. But when Peter saw this, he replied to the people, Men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Why do you gaze at us 
as if by our own power or piety we made him walk. And Peter and John began to preach the gospel unto them. So these gifts were miraculous, outside the realm of natural ability, and often and instantaneous. So the question is then, what were the purpose of these gifts? Even in our gift giving today, we give gifts for a purpose. No one just gives a gift out of the blue. I actually know they do. But oftentimes the purpose is to be nice or it's a thoughtful gesture. You know, we give gifts to commemorate anniversaries or, uh, or birthdays or, or uh, gifts of friendship. Uh, but our gifts have a purpose. Uh, for example, when I left Oregon, my dad gave me three gifts. One I forgot in Oregon. Maps of all 50 United States, a toolkit, and jumper cables. They were gifts, but they all had a specific purpose. I forgot the maps, but I remember the toolkit and jumper cables. So, But it was a gift. I was not expecting it. It was a nice gesture, but they had a purpose. I was moving into my own place for the first time, and my dad is one that says, you can't dress, trust Home Depot or the maintenance guys to do it, so you got to do it yourself. And I didn't have jumper cables in my car. And he was, doesn't trust the phones to be reliable for GPS, so he gave me the maps, which I forgot. Um, but gifts have purposes. And so what were the purposes of spiritual gifts? In the gospel, in the ministry of Jesus himself, he gives light to this in John chapter 5. Looking at verse um, 36 here. In John chapter 5 and verse 36. Jesus speaking here about the witness of his works, that is miracles. He says, but the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John. For the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do, testify about me, that the Father has sent me. And he is speaking about the miraculous works. So far in the Gospel of John, he has has turned water into wine. He has healed sick, again, instantaneously and miraculously. But Jesus is very plain. These gifts are not just for gift's sake. They're not just to show off. They're for a purpose. They're to testify that I am from God and I am approved by God. And... That was the case in Christ's ministry, and that purpose still transferred over to the early church. If you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we're going to be mainly here for this next point, starting in verse 8. We see the purpose of these gifts, and to add context in the first century world, um, we're talking... 35, 36, probably even 40 in that range A.D. The printing press would not be invented in Geneva until the beginning of the Renaissance, more or less. Close to 15 to 1700 years later. So it's not like they could mass produce the Gospels or the Epistles. It's not like they could mass produce Bibles or make a approved document and send it out to all the churches so they have to have teaching. In fact, most congregations in the early church would not have had a copy of Scripture until we're talking close of the first century, beginning of the second. Um, the specific churches we find to have letters written to them, they would have had those letters, and they've been working at transcribing those and passing on to other churches, but we don't see the full canon yet in the churches. So this is a young church under construction, being built up. And we see here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting um, in verse 8. Yes. Um, For one is given a word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, and to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit. And to the, another, the effecting of miracles, and to another, prophecy, and to another, the distinguishing of spirits, and to another, various kinds of tongues, and to the other, another, the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all things, distributing to each one individually, just as he wills. 
We have the gifts here. There's uh, several listed. Words of wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, identifying of spirits, or identifying whether it was a spirit of prophecy or the man's is speaking out of his own mind, so the understanding of prophecy, tongues and the interpretation of tongues. And we've already hinted at what the purpose was in John chapter 5, but if you look up at verse 7, what was the purpose? Paul says here, but to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. It's for the building up of the church. Notice the categories that these gifts fall, on, fall into. Um, there's three categories, more or less. You have revelation, or revealing spiritual truths from God. That would have been wisdom and knowledge. You would have signs of confirmation that this is the truth, and they are speaking for God, or from God. That is miraculous faith, healing, and miracle working. And then you have the four gifts of edification or building up. Uh, tongues, interpretation, prophecy, and its discernment. Again, why would tongues be a miraculous gift needed to build up? Well, you have multi-ethnic uh, cities here, multi-linguistic peoples, who need to understand the Word of God accurately. So the best way to do that was speak it in their birth tongue, their birth language. Um, and up until the modern era, people were multilingual. They could speak three to four different languages, but not as we think it, not with complete perfection. If I was a Jewish uh, merchant living on the coast range, I would have known enough Hebrew to get through synagogue. I probably would have spoken a little Aramaic if I was from that region, so my birth tongue, so I probably would have spoken that perfectly. I might know Greek or Latin to do business with the tradesmen who come to the port, but I wouldn't know all those languages perfectly. My Hebrew would be religious Hebrew related to the Torah. My Greek and Latin would be relayed to the realm of business and merchandise. Aramaic would have been the home life. So I would have impartial knowledge of all these languages, so the best way to teach me the gospel was in my native language would be Aramaic. And this was the case not just in Jerusalem, but everywhere in the ancient world. So you have individuals who are in these cities who have different backgrounds and different understandings, and you want to make sure the word of God is transmitted to them and they understand it accurately and perfectly. And again, the best way to do that is speak it in a language that they understand. That's where we get the gifts of tongues. And the interpretation of tongues, because you may have an individual who has the gift of revealing knowledge, but his native tongue may be Arabic, and he's in Corinth. So we have the interpretation of the tongues, so the, so the individual speaking might be understood by everyone in the congregation. This is no different when we, when we see um, uh, congregations, to, well, it's a little bit different, but similar to congregations today on military bases overseas. You know, I've had individuals tell me about the time in Germany that the congregation speaks German. You may have people outside the congregation from different countries. Well, they have translators. They have people to translate the message so you understand with, perfect, uh, with perfection. That way you are edified by the service as well. It's the same kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> in short, um, these spiritual gifts were to reveal truth and confirm the same truth. That was their purpose. In, a, in the absence of the written word, the young church needed within each congregation individuals who could further instruct after the apostles had left and individuals who can maintain the standard of sound words um, until that which is perfect had come. So, getting to the text then, again, back in 1 Timothy, we understand it was a spiritual gift. We know that. The text says so. Um, and it was for a specific purpose. He was in the role of preaching and ministry, and so he probably, and this is old Britain speaking here, um, not the word of God, it probably was in the realm of revelation or, or of confirming of truth since he was in a position to publicly teach. Um, so, but then the question is, what about the laying on of hands? Because some have argued that this text shows that it was the elders who could bestow a gift. If that is the case, Ronnie, Brett, Maurice, Mark, Jim, we need to talk after services. Um, I would like instantaneous knowledge. But it's not the case. For a number of reasons. 
One, the laying on of hands used in the Bible does not always mean the imparting of spiritual gifts. In fact, 90% of the time, it is either a conferring of a blessing or giving of authority to somebody. Example in Genesis chapter 48, we see one example in the Old Testament about this. Um, in Genesis chapter 8, and this is an artist's rendition, rendition of the blessing of Israel onto uh, his sons there. Uh, looking at verse 14 here. But Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on the head of Ephraim, who was the younger, and the left hand on Manasseh's head, crossing his hands, although Manasseh was the firstborn. He blessed Joseph and said, The God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who had redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads, that, they may, that my name may live on in them, and the names of my fathers Abraham and Isaac may grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. Israel's not giving any sort of spiritual gift here. It's a common practice in the ancient world to do this when you're setting, again, giving a blessing or setting somebody off on a specific task or giving them authority. Um, So we have that case. Um, We don't have time to read it, but for example, in Numbers chapter 8, if you want to write that down, Numbers chapter 8, verses 9 and 10, before the Levites could engage in their priestly office, the whole congregation of Israel laid their hands upon them to confer upon them the authority as their spiritual shepherds. They were presented before God after they had been ceremonially cleansed. The congregation placed their hands upon them before they could enter into the service. Now they still had to do the sacrifices to atone for their own sins. But there we see a case in the Old Testament where the laying on hands was to confer authority for a specific task or a specific office. In the New Testament, it's used both ways. In Acts chapter 13, we see Paul and Barnabas getting ready to go on their first preaching trip. And notice what the church of Antioch does here. In Acts chapter 13, looking at the first three verses. Now they were at Antioch in the church... And their uh, prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simon, who was uh, called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manan, who had been brought up with uh, Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. Then, when they had fasted and prayed, laid their hands on them, then they sent them away. Again, same type of thing. The congregation was sending them off, the Spirit had commissioned them for this work, and the congregation laid their hands to signify and show that, yes, you have been appointed for this work, and we're sending you off. In the New Testament, we see the other case is the giving of the gifts. But notice in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8 here, starting verse 14. This is after the church has been scattered. Saul is persecuting the church, and we have the Christian diaspora from Jerusalem. And Philip, the evangelist, goes to Samaria and converts several. And starting verse 14, it says, Now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to him Peter and John. Note, apostles, Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Notice also, these individuals had, were baptized believers. They were saved, but they did not have the Spirit. Salvation and the gifts are separate. Not all Christians had gifts in the first century. In fact, if you read the letter of Titus, Titus, there's no indication that Titus had any such gift. Timothy did. I have my own thoughts about that. Timothy seems to be a little bit more timid. Needs a little bit more encouragement. Titus has a very short letter. Um, Titus is sent to Crete, a very rough neighborhood. Um, Titus seems to be a little bit bolder. But you see that the gifts were not given to everybody across the board. But continue on. Uh, Verse 17. Then they began laying their hands on them, and they, that is the Sumerians, were receiving the Holy Spirit. 
Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through, them, uh, bestowed through the laying on of, hand, of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give the authority to me as well, that, so that everyone whom I lay my hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. A few notes here. If other individuals besides the apostles could give the gifts, why did not Simon ask another Samaritan? He doesn't. He saw that the gifts were only given through the laying on the apostles' hands. So he asked the apostles. He tries to buy it. He's immediately rebuked for it and basically told, go burn and your silver because you have blasphemed God and you thought you could buy the gift. But he understood where it came from. Only the apostles could transfer these gifts. And this is because in the early church, only the apostles had all gifts, and only the apostles were set apart from the, by the Spirit. And in the early church, there's only two ways you could receive the gifts. Holy Spirit baptism, which there's only two recorded instances. We talked about the first in Acts 2. The apostles were given that. And then Cornelius in Acts 10. The reason Cornelius was given that, because he is the first Gentile convert. And Peter need to be heavily convinced that he was okay to, be, to preach the gospel to. So Cornelius' gifts were given so that Peter, and Peter actually says in Acts 10, says, if they have received the Spirit like we, who are we to refuse water that these may be baptized? Peter had to get through his thick skull that Gentiles were welcome to God. That was the purpose there. And then we see the laying on of hands. But getting back to the thing, is Timothy a special case? Do the elders, does Timothy 4.14 expand it to where the eldership can bestow a gift? Go into 1 Timothy 4.14. Let's read it for context here. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which is bestowed upon you through the prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. Now, knowing what we know so far, that only apostles can give the gifts, I think it's a very easy case right now where we could say, no, the Presbytery did not give the gift. But let's look into it and actually answer it. So, few problems with this argument. Paul states that Timothy already had the gift. And if you read the second letter of Timothy, in chapter 1 and verse 6, it makes it abundantly clear he says, for this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. That's Paul speaking, an apostle. So that's where he got the gift, was through Paul. It was given through the means of the prophetic utterance or, by, or, or accompanied by that. But it was not the elders who did that. In fact, the event occurred, let's see, the laying on hands by the elders, the event occurred at the same time the young evangelist was appointed to a ministry by an eldership. It was with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. That with there is meta in the Greek. And meta does not express the instrument of means, but merely the accompaniment. For example, we do not practice the laying on of hands today, but we have similar customs. When I first came here, and it was my first Sunday here as one of your preachers at the time. Maurice was given the announcements, and I was new. And so the recognition that I was here to work with you all as an evangelist, he asked me to stand up and introduce myself. I, I waved. I remember that. My memory might be faulty, but that's a custom we have. In fact, we do it when we have new members. We ask them to stand up so we might all see who they are and get to know their faces and get to better know them. Um, we do that so we recognize that they're part of the congregation now. First century, the practice may have been, well, they laid their hands on them and, and said, yes, you're part of this congregation now. It was a common practice that these elders were doing to Timothy. They were recognizing the work that he was doing or about to do with the congregation. Also, the laying on the hands in verse 14 was definitely the same type of laying on hands we saw in Acts 13, the commissioning for work, as we talked about. So wrapping this up now, does this still happen today? Turn me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We were just there in chapter 12, and Paul's going on and on about the, the, 
the types of gifts of the Spirit and, and how, everyone, how certain individuals have this one and this one. But what does it say in, verse, in chapter 13? He says here, If I speak in tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy, I know all the mysteries and all the knowledge, and I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Jumping down to verse 8. Love never fails, but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect comes, the partial will be done away. So here we have an approved apostle who was filled with the Holy Spirit, had all gifts, and he's telling us plainly. He's telling the Corinthians plainly and telling us plainly today. The gifts were partial. They had a specific purpose for a season. And then when that which is perfect would come, the partial would be done away with. So what is that which is perfect? It is the recorded in the Holy Word of God in its completed form as we have it today. In Jude 3, we are told that we have the faith once and for all handed down to the saints, never to be repeated. And later on in the text, we read in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 through 17, that this perfect word of God, the word of God is perfect and is able to equip us for every good work. And Peter, towards the end of the first century, which by that time we have evidence that the canon was well completed at that point, all 27 books of your New Testament, He says, God has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. That is 2 Peter 1 and verse 3. There is no need for miraculous gifts today because there is no other revelation from God. There is no need for the attesting miracles because this has been already approved and sent from God. It has been attested time and time again. There is no need for any of that. Because we have that which is promised. The Holy Spirit has given us that which is perfect so that we can learn from it that which God would have us to do and be God pleasing unto Him. There is still one gift, however, that the Spirit does bestow upon every believer today it is the gift of salvation. In Acts chapter 2, in verse 38 here, Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. After Peter had preached the gospel in its entirety for the first time on the day of Pentecost, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, the crowd there said to the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter just accused them and convicted them that you are guilty of the body of Christ. Your sins put them on that cross. And so what does he say? Peter said to him, repent, and each one will be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, For the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That gift, unlike spiritual gifts, applies to everybody. It is the gift of salvation. It is the gift of assurance that you are saved if you are seeking after Christ and doing his will. If you are faithful unto death, as Revelation 2 and verse 10 tells us. But if you are outside Christ, you do not have that gift. You do not have that assurance. You are without hope. For the apostles tell us there is only one name on earth by which men must be saved, and that is Jesus Christ. So if we can help you be saved this morning, to be fully trusting and surrendering your life to Jesus in the waters of baptism, we would love to help you with that this morning. If you need prayers of strength, prayers of restoration, please make that need be known now as here we stand and sing the song of invitation.